and welcome to Dialogue. December 20th this year marks the seventh anniversary of a free trade agreement between both China and South Korea and China and Australia. Despite China remaining the largest trade partner of both countries, bilateral relations with the two nations have been facing challenges in recent years. How have the two trade agreements performed over the past seven years? And how can obstacles be overcome to further expand economic cooperation? To answer these questions, I'm glad to be joined today by Professor Chen Hong from East China Normal University and David Ma Hong, Executive Chairman at the Ma Hong China Investment Management. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to the discussion, Professor Chen Hong and David. Uh, let's start with some general picture to take a look at the trade relationship between China and South Korea and China and Australia. Uh, David, I will start with you. How would you characterize you know, China-South Korea trade relationship since they signed the free trade deal like seven years ago? <clears throat> it's got tremendous basis to it. Um, and although there are competitive areas in, um, in both economies, Essentially, um, South Korea and China have a lot to offer each other. And throughout the seven years, this has been demonstrated. However, it's been also disrupted because of political um, differences between the two countries. And South Korea, to some extent, is subject to the pressures of American foreign policy and American containment policy of China. But South Korea seems quite able to manage that to a degree that it hasn't really damaged it as much as it did back under the Obama administration when Thad missiles were pay, placed in, in South Korea, clearly um, angled in terms of a, a position against China. So I think the potential is good. And I think also that South Korea's economy itself is in good in a good position compared to certain certainly developed Western economies and also some of its Asian neighbors. So we should be seeing a recovery in the South Korean economy, quite a strong or firm recovery as we go into 2023. Mm -hmm. Well, South Korea is the uh, largest source of Chinese import and also the second largest source of foreign investment in the Chinese market. So it's a, it's a big player. Uh, but Cho Hong, uh, in the first half of this year, 2022, 40% uh, of uh, South Korea's export uh, comes from this uh, semiconductor sector. So semiconductor export to China accounts uh, for you know, a very important part of their trade with China. As David uh, pointed out, the US is applying pressure on the Korean side to limit uh, uh, you know, export of some of these uh, semiconductor products. Uh, so how do you think South Korea will try to, again, strike a balance or manage to avoid the U.S. pressure and to maintain their business presence in China. Yeah, I think the Korean government has always been under, you know, demands, impositions of demands and pressures from the United States. You know, David was also mentioning about the SAR system, the, the, the deployment of the, of the anti-missile SAR system. Uh, it's just one example, you know, during which time, of course, you know, uh, you know, this kind of uh, deployment definitely threatens the security of China. So, you know, simply at the expense of the China-South Korean relations and the reasons, you know, uh, US move, arbitrary move, you know, to restrict exports of semiconductor chips to uh, China, you know, for, you know, uh, is uh, another act of bullying with the uh, purpose of the, to rein China's developments. You know, Korean, on the other hand, is of course an independent country. You know, although the uh, United States has a special relationship with Seoul, but uh, Korea, like Australia, needs to be aware of the long-term strategic interests, you know, rather than the, uh, uh, the, the short-term demands from the United States. I think the Seoul governments might succumb to uh, the U.S. demands to some degree, you know, you know, because as we know out of South Korea's uh, uh, 96 billion uh, U.S. dollars memory chips exports, Last year, uh, that was uh, uh, forty-eight uh, percent to China. You know, I think actually the uh, South Korea will be using delays as a tactic and will try to postpone 
you know, talking with the United States because they can't say no to US uh, requirements. But it needs to ratify and make remedies as quickly as possible so as not to bring serious damages to the bilateral relations with, uh, with China. Mm -hmm. well, David, here's a question, you know, uh, the US will pressure Australia, will pressure South Korea, basically to uh, reduce their relationship with China at the expense of, of their own national interests. Uh, and also in the violation of the World Free Trade Agreement, you know, World Free Trade, you know, WTO, for example, all those kind of uh, uh, multilateral approaches that you know, uh, countries agreed upon. Uh, there's the free trade. I mean, how can the U.S. intervene the relationship between, for example, China and Australia, China and South Korea, uh, without being noticed or without being punished here? Well, first of all, America's done a very good job, and Biden has continued the Trump positions on this, of dismantling the WTO, particularly um, the appellate body. So really, there aren't enough judges. There isn't a mechanism to, to hear um, disputes in the way that WTO is dependent upon. So America will brook no reduction of its power globally. Anywhere where it is going to find any reduction of its influence, it will make all moves to try and um, prevent that anywhere in the world. Um, this is a blind position. It's based purely on power, as power, ultimately power is its own outcome, its own reward. So the other ramifications for domestic trade, um, for domestic commercial balance within the U.S., unfortunately, has been coming second to the same. So it has an idea that it must contain China, but this is something that America has always expected it could do, even through the immensely positive years from the early 90s, running right into the beginning of the century, um, up until, um, you know, you can chart the decline, I would even say from Bill Clinton onwards, there was a, a political decline in the rapport, in the um, the, the juxtaposition of, of America's political regional interests and the commercial relationship with China. But always containment was a part of this. Just look at American military deployment in Asia. Um, it is, it's huge, it's staggering. I think there's over 80 bases um, that directly relate to this region and the containment of China. But it is something that won't succeed. Uh, they will spend years pursuing this further. They will try particularly in technology to reduce China's development. And so this puts tremendous pressure on a country like South Korea. And as Tian Hong said, it's not easy for Korea just to ignore that. They will have to in some way comply with the US. But in the end, if China can be non-reactive, if China can be patient and just do all that it's doing now and pursuing its own economic development, its own opening and its own support of globalism, opening to the world. America will fail in its own endeavors by itself. It doesn't need China to push back. It doesn't need a fight. China's best way of fighting is to be as focused and still as possible. Don't react. <clears throat> Don't respond to every statement that the US makes and realize that they're not gonna change. They're not gonna change until they recognize they've failed. So it's a very difficult time ahead for all of us um, who are, I mean, I'm 40 years in China. So it's my home, <clears throat> my business activities are all foreign clients. So there are tremendous things to actually deal with. But I think China is doing a reasonable job and I'm sure it will improve its game going forward. And gradually one by one, these coerced trading partners of the US who are also major trading partners with China, will just not put up with the impact on their domestic economies that following and obeying America is bringing about. And they'll shift and they'll gradually begin to compromise and move away from that American grip. Europe will go through the same process. Once there is a truce or an end to this terrible war in Ukraine, I think then you'll see European countries will heed America less and less. So it's about biding one's time with, from strength and with strength. And I'm sure that China can do that. 
Well, uh, Chen Hong, as David said uh, very well, you know, uh, if China will focus, continue to focus on its economic development, offering market access uh, to uh, economies like uh, South Korea, Australia, and many other countries, and ultimately, I mean, China will win the hearts and also the the, the interest too. Uh, speak of that, you know, you, if you look at RCEP, um, which includes both China and uh, South Korea and Japan. And the three countries have also been basically in negotiation for 10 plus years to reach a trilateral uh, trade agreement, but uh, without uh, much uh, you know, uh, progress over there. Will RCEP, in a sense, bring the three countries closer in terms of uh, trade? Talking about RCEP and also the, uh, uh, the uh, China, uh, Japan, and South Korea uh, FTAs, I think actually the uh, uh, the whole process, in particular the uh, trilateral uh, FTA, have been, have, has been a long process of uh, you know discussions and uh, negotiations. The three countries, you know, uh, Japan, South Korea, and uh, China, have been discussing mainly on uh, points of uh, the so-called modality, you know, including ways of liberalization and negotiation process. You know, the uh, implementation of RCEP, I think, meanwhile, has been able to facilitate the uh, solution of issues of disparity, in particular in the goods uh, sector, including for the rules of origin, you know, customs, you know, trade remedy, you know, sanitary, you know, and also technical uh, barriers to trade. So I think RCEP, you know, RCEP provides a very important springboard for, for the three countries to further negotiate, of course, there are external factors as we were discussing, such as the pressures from the, uh, the United States, Chip 4, for example, and other uh, pressures. Uh, but I believe that the three countries, in particular, Korea and Japan, have their own, as we said, you know, the long-term national interests to look after, which provides the momentum to advance the progress of the talks. Mm -hmm. uh, well, David, uh, now we had a new government in Canberra since May, uh, Albanese government, uh, it is different from a Morrison government uh, in terms of this relationship with uh, Washington, in terms of uh, you know, its relationship with Beijing, for example. It has to be better. <clears throat> it couldn't be worse. Um, and any comparison to the Morrison government is immediately Albanese's government looks a lot better. But I think there is more depth than that. I think there is a, um, a subtlety. I think there is a discernment that they will find a way to except or the olive branches that I think um, since the election um, uh, Beijing has offered. And also you have in that in that cabinet probably one probably the most able politician in that part of the South Pacific and the Southern Hemisphere, which is Foreign Minister Penny Wong. Um, and she's someone of tremendous ability. Uh, her, her her track record um, has been, very consistent in someone who's thoughtful, perceptive. How it goes in the medium term, however, with American foreign policy is another matter. And I'm not optimistic that Australia can so easily shift away from the huge pressure of um, American strategic interest. AUKUS is an example of this. Why don't they pull out of AUKUS? I mean, it's an absurd and, and stupid um, uh, coalition. And agreement. No one benefits except American arms manufacturers. So, um, but we should have some hope that Penny Wong is is, is coming to Beijing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor Chen Hong, you know, Penny Wong is coming to Beijing this week. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. be in Beijing uh, meeting the Chinese counterparts, uh, and and then you know, what's we expect? Uh, are we going to see a reset of the relationship between the two countries? Yeah. First of all, I think actually Penny Wong's visit to China. Is a is a is a major major step, you know. I think towards a recovery of the balance relations. I think it is a concrete step, you know, taken by Canberra after the Bali sum, uh, summit between President Xi Jinping and Albanese, and it also holds uh, some historical significance as the Penny was meeting with uh, uh, Wang Yi will take place on the 50th anniversary of the uh, establishment of the diplomatic relationship between the two countries. So I think actually, you know, uh, both sides have not only demonstrated this kind of willingness and sincerity to solve issues of dispute, but also have been, you know, proactively, you know, working, you know, to uh, reset 
the ratio to steer the uh, uh, ratio to, uh, back to a more you know uh, yeah you know rational track. So I think actually this is very important. Meanwhile, of course, we cannot forget about the influence from Washington, in particular when we are remembering about a nightmare that uh, you know uh, Scott Morrison stint as uh, Austria's prime minister have been bringing to the balance relations between China and Australia, the imprudent miscalculation and mishandling of various issues, you know, uh, you know, between China and Australia by Scott Morrison, you know, well, you know, simply it has little sensible foresight disregarding the value of the uh, Australia-China uh, partnership in various areas. But, uh, you know, uh, since the, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, I was indicating, uh, since the, uh, uh, the, the new government, the new Labour government, you know, to, took office. It has been showing a kind of, you know, uh, willingness, or even should I say, a kind of alacrity to ratify, you know, the Morrison government's uh, diplomatic, you know, missteps, responding to the rational appeals from various cycles, you know, uh, you know, in Australia to stop the deterioration of uh, Australian relationship with uh, its uh, biggest trade partner. So I think actually this kind of return of uh, diplomacy of sensibility you know, it's very important. And with the uh, Albanese one team, you know, handling, uh, you know, you know uh, it's a uh, China policies with this kind of, you know, more diplomatic, you know, uh, uh, style, this is quite important and practical. Mm -hmm. uh, so China, is the trip more about uh, stabilizing the relationship or, or recovering the relationship from damages, you know, done by previous government or about a specific achievement like, uh, you know, lifting of restrictions on the Australian exports to China, some of the products. And of course, from the Chinese side, they're looking at improving the investment environment uh, by Chinese firms in Australia. Yeah, I think we need to remember that for almost five or six years, you know, the bilateral relations you know, have been you know, in a freeze. You know, there were no high level mysterious dialogues between the two governments. And also, you know, the, uh, there was really, you know, I, sh I should say, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, for example, last year, you know, there were repeated threats of war from Canberra with China, you know, talking about drums of war being, you know, uh, being, being, being beating, you know, to instigate some kind of a military confrontation with China. So again, this background, you know, this current dialogue and also, you know, meetings are very important because actually, for in particular, of course, the Bali summit between President Xi Jinping and Albanese. I think this is actually a kind of you know top-down uh, you know you know maneuver to try to ratify the current you know uh, you know decline of the bilateral relations. It was really almost like a free fall, you know you know a kind of you know a sharp uh, down spiraling you know decline of the bilateral relations. But uh, again, this background, I think what we have been achieving so far is very important to discuss, to talk, to try to discuss about issues of disputes and try to see common grounds. I think actually the Austrian side will be continuing to push for some kind of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the so-called lifting of some kind of uh, you know, restrictions of uh, 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 measures, you know, imposed on Australia uh, uh, imports, but definitely, you know, that was not a kind of economic section or coercion as uh, the Australian side, in particular, the Morrison government have been talking about. The uh, trade disputes are definitely, you know, should be uh, handled at the trade level, at the business level, not to be, you know, politicized, so that actually can be handled in a more proper way. I think actually the Chinese side also has got its uh, concerns, our concerns to maintain a stable government. That is why I think actually the uh, uh, Penny Wong and also Evanese have been talking about trying to stabilize the relationship. I, I think the first step is to stabilize the relationship. And then, of course, we talk about uh, improvements or even to strengthening uh, for a better relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, David, uh, do you think, you know, if you look at the, uh, we talk about the you know, US factor in China's relationship with Australia or with South Korea, I mean, that's a big factor, obviously. Uh, the US is trying to contain China, uh, you know, trying to set up uh, all kinds of camps, basically uh, to, to isolate China or to divide this region, uh, like Indo-Pacific economic framework, you know, uh, things like that. But that's not really in the interest of, uh, uh, I mean, regional economies, including Australia, because they have a very close economic ties uh, over there. Um, but, but do you think Australia, they are fully aware of that? 
I don't think they are. <clears throat> and I think that we, we are, in any of these, um, these observations, uh, we have to take into account <clears throat> that the West is currently in decline and Australia is um, a Western nation. It's not attached to Europe or, or America physically, of course, but it, it, the trends in those countries, of, in countries of Europe and, and in the United States, reflect very much in the Australian society and also economy. So this decline is something that Australia would have to make some very radical choices to avoid being bound in. Um, it can begin to go further down as, as America is in influence, um, not suffering, of course, the internal problems that America suffers. But in, in a sense, too, let's be very clear about Australia's continuity in terms of its relationship with Asia. There has always been a reticence in Australia related to Asia. Previous governments to these, under the Howard government, for instance, there was a very famous quote that Prime Minister Howard made, which was Asia was the place to fly over <clears throat> to conduct business in Europe and the States. And changing this mindset um, is still something that needs to be achieved in a political and social sense. I think there are racial issues internally in, uh, in Australia that need to be dealt with. And the huge pressure of the Western media, the Murdoch press is a good example where, and I'm, in, I'm, I'm being interviewed from London today where I've just, I've been here for the last three weeks and um, otherwise in Europe on, on, a, on business trip, a business trip. And I'm, I'm struck at the negativity and the misinformation, the propaganda that exists in the West in respect of China, of course, COVID is one of the big subjects, but um, also the Chinese economy, Chinese political stability. It's like they're seeing the reverse of the situation that exists. So this is a factor. So I think while the economic drivers are very powerful, um, and as Chen Hong said, Australian products are highly res respected by the Chinese middle class consumers and by Chinese industry. And that's true. I think China, in terms of um, Australia, probably has the best beef in the world. It's grass fed and grain finished. Um, that's been blocked now for some time. And ironically, its um, stronger ally, the United States, has taken advantage of the loss of the beef market in China. And China's now flooded with American beef. So it begs all sorts of questions about um, motive there. But Australian products, horticultural products, agricultural products are very well respected and trusted for good reason by Chinese consumers. So the one hope is that businesses will be pragmatic and that will be the pressure on government. But it takes companies to be brave, to invest here, to send their people here when uh, the COVID restrictions abate. There's going to be a major restaffing of companies with representatives. And if Australian firms can really be um, audacious in doing that, that will help to shift their government's thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Chen Hong, what do you make of this long-term, I mean, uh, relationship between China and Australia? Uh, is the camera capable of uh, striking a balance between its ties, its security ties with the United States and its economic ties with, with China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think actually we have already been uh, discussing about this question about uh, kind of keeping a balance between China and uh, uh, the United States for Australia. But uh, for Australia, I think, uh, well, the uh, choice uh, had uh, already been made. That is actually politically and also in terms of security. Uh, it was sided with the United States and it holds the, uh, its uh, alliance with the United States, uh, you know, as its priority in security agendas. That is definitely out of the question. Uh, and uh, nobody should, uh, you know, you know, you know, uh, you, you know, you know, try to imagine that uh, Australia will be shifting, you know, its allegiance to, uh, you know, to another country, for example, like uh, well, China or, you know, or any, any other countries. But uh, Australia seems to have this kind of uh, long-term historical and political, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, um, you know obstinate, you know, uh, uh, allegiance uh, towards its alliance with uh, 
the United States, and of course, previously with uh, the UK. But, uh, and also, uh, as uh, you know, uh, David was also pointing out, there are also possibly some kind of racial uh, issues at play, you know, because in, in history, uh, there was this white Australian policy, which has been uh, uh, playing as a kind of, you know, undercurrent, uh, you, know, uh, you know, underneath uh, its uh, foreign policies. Uh, in spite of the uh, uh, the multiculturalism which has been in place as its national policy, but on the other hand, of course, uh, uh, national interest, I should say, is uh, very important for any political leaders with sensibility. You know, if we look at uh, Australia's you know long-term strategic interests in the long run, you know, trying to sacrifice its own interests for the sake of the the uh, interests in particular the uh, status of hegemony of the United States, India, Asia Pacific, in the world is simply, you know, a kind of, you know, simplistic and also naive, you know, uh, 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 you know, you know statesmanship. That's why I think uh, uh, Scott Morrison's uh, stint of uh, prime ministership have been not only a disaster for China-Australia relations, but also for Australia's strategic uh, developments for its own, you know, political and economic developments. So it is quite uh, wise. That's uh, that's why I think think that actually the, the Albanese government has been having playing this kind of, uh, uh, you know, a style of uh, political wisdom, trying to handle its relationship with China in a more rational way. That is actually the first step. That actually we think actually that is very important to uh, you know more. Uh, stabilized and also rational relationship. And that is very important for the stability of the bilateral relationship and also for the stability and also peace and the prosperity of the region. Well, with that, we come to the end for today's discussion. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGT app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qingdu. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.